All right, how's everybody doing today? Outstanding. So uh, here's today's question, uh, and I don't think it's, mo most of my questions I think you can come up with an immediate answer to. I don't think you're going to be able to answer today's question uh, in the last 28 minutes of today's service. In fact, I'm not even sure uh, 24 hours from now you're going to have a complete and full answer for today's question. It might take you uh, days or weeks or, I don't know, a long time to figure out. Here, here's, here's the question. Uh, what do you want your obituary to say about you when you die? That's kind of a morbid question, maybe. <laughs> but but here's, a, here, here's a reality. All of us in this room are going to die unless the Lord returns, right? That would be great. But if the Lord doesn't return 100 years from now, 110 years from now, uh, probably every one of us in this room, every one of us watching, all of us will have passed away. And, and we, we live in a, in a time where we, not, we want to avoid that reality. We want to do everything we can to not talk about the fact that we're going to die. Uh, and, and, and I don't know why we do that because uh, to me, we should acknowledge the fact we're going to die. It reminds us that I'm a stranger here. Heaven's my home. <laughs> I wasn't designed to live here forever. I was designed to live with the Lord forever in a real place called heaven. The, the, the reality is someday you're going to die and someone, your family member, is going to write your obituary, right? And your, your obituary is going to uh, include the standard data probably, where, where you were born, where you lived, where you went to school, who you married, if you had any kids, what you did for a living. And, and your entire life will be summarized in four or five paragraphs, it, 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 it'll mention things that you enjoy doing, right? He enjoyed playing golf. It, it might uh, mention uh, something like she, she, en she enjoyed making quilts. He, 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 had the, he had the best yard in the whole neighborhood. She was an avid Bible study attender. He was a very successful businessman, which is code for he was filthy rich. <laughs> What's your obituary going to say? When, when, when your entire life is summarized in 250 words, what, what do you want those words to be about you? What, what do you want them to say about what was important to you, what you, what you were ambitious to achieve in your lifetime? This morning... I brought some, brought some pictures with me. I did some Google searching. According, according to Google, these are, these are some of the most beautiful natural formations in the planet. This first one is Vermilion Cliffs in, in uh, a National Monument in Arizona. Anybody ever been to this uh, uh, National Monument? Anybody ever been there? Nobody's ever been to this one. We're in Nebraska. You, how many of you have been to Iowa? Anybody ever been to... <laughs> Goodness, I don't know what's wrong with you guys, right? I, lo I, love, I love this, right? It looks like the rocks are, are water, right? It looks like they have motion to them. That, that's, that's a stunning, stunning uh, natural formation. How about this next one? This next one uh, is, uh, is actually in the Sahara Desert in this place. I don't know how you pronounce that name. But here's the interesting thing about this. To really uh, enjoy or, or uh, understand the beauty of this, you need to take it from a plane 30,000 feet or from outer space because it's 28 miles across. This formation from, from one side to the other side is 28 miles. It's called the Eye of the Sahara. How about the next one? The next one is called uh, the Giant's Causeways. It's in Northern Ireland. And, and, and there's uh, 40,000 of these five-sided uh, or six-sided shapes, uh, all this whole island out here. It, it, they're, they're so, uh, they're, they're so uh, similar to one another, it almost looks like it's man-made. But it's a, it's a natural formation. Or how about this last one? This last one is uh, back here in the United States. This is Bryce Canyon National Park. Has anybody been to this national park? And you, thank you. We got some people who traveled to Utah. I'm glad to see Nebraskans get out once in a while, right? Stunningly beautiful. I would imagine this is early in the morning or late in the night as the sun's rising. You see the different colors uh, in the sediments in the rocks there. The question is, how did these formations come to be? 
And, and I think all of us know enough about science that, that over time, erosion using wind and water ca caused every one of these rock formations to form. Here's, here's the point of today's sermon. Every one of us in this room, every one of us watching, Pastor Lee and all of us, like these rock formations, are being transformed and formed into something or someone. Every one of us in the room, every one of us watching, are being formed by the, by, by the forces of this world and that forming us into something day by day, bit by bit, bit, throughout our entire lives until the day we die, we are being formed into something and on the day we die, someone's gonna describe what our formation looked like. Everything in our life forms us, and, 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 and don't, don't, don't um, overlook that reality. Your daily decisions are forming you. Your, your, your childhood hurts are forming you. Your habits are forming you. Your relationships are forming you. Your attitudes are forming you. The question is this, is what are they forming you into? <laughs> Are, are, are they forming you into the person that you want to be? Or if you're absolutely honest with yourself, the pressures and, and the forces of this world is kind of forming them into something I don't really want to be. How, how, would, how would your friends describe you right now? Would, would they describe you as someone who's generous <laughs> with, with all that God's entrusted to them, their time, their relationships, their resources? Would, would, would your friends describe you as someone who's generous or someone who's stingy? Would, would you be described as someone who's anxious or someone who's happy? Would, would, would you by, be described as someone who loves life or someone who's living life? What is it that you are being formed into? And, and, and here's what I want you to know, that, that all, these, all these things that are forming us, the good, the bad, and the ugly, all of us ex have experienced, in some ways, the same things. And, and so even the bad things can form us into something beautiful. Or vice versa, the good things can form us into something that's not so beautiful. <laughs> Uh, Martin Luther's, uh, uh, his experience in life formed him into what he became, a reformer of the Christian church in 1500. But, but similar forces uh, formed Hitler into the guy that he became. There, there, were, there were forces that, that formed Mother Teresa into the person that she became, willing to, 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 to sacrifice her life in the slums of Calcutta. And, and, and very similar forces formed the mean old man who lived down the street when you were a little kid. All of us have forces forming us, good forces, bad forces, indifferent forces. The, 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 the question is, what is it forming you into? Someone you want to be or someone you really don't want to be? Our, our fifth characteristic of serving today is ambition. And, and it follows uh, these other ones here, attitude and availability and action and ability and today ambition. A ambition... Um, Ambition is, is described this way. It's a strong desire uh, to achieve something. A strong a desire to do or to achieve something. Something that often takes uh, determination and hard work. What are you ambitious about? Here, here's what I'll tell you. There's a connection between what you're ambitious about now and what your obituary is gonna say the day you die. They kinda line up. And if you want to know what your obituary is going to say the day you die, look at what your calendar and your checkbook says today. Because that also gives me a hint of what you're ambitious about. 
What do you think, if, if they would have written, if, if they would have written um, obituaries 2,000 years ago, what would Jesus' obituary have said? What, what, would, what would have been the 350 words that, that would have described Jesus' 33 short years on this planet? Uh, there's lots of passages, I think, Right? That, that described Jesus' life and what he was like. One of them's in, in the Gospel of Matthew in the 20th chapter. Matthew 20, 28, Jesus writes these words, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life for a ransom for many. What was, what was Jesus, uh, what was Jesus uh, ambitious about? Jesus was ambitious about people who, who were lost and were hopeless. That's us. <laughs> Jesus was a- ambitious. He, he was determined to, to, to create a way for, for us, even though it was gonna be hard work, including a cross. And Jesus was ambition to create a way that sinners like Pastor Lee, like sinners like us, like sinners like you watching, that we might have a way to, uh, to be with him forever in a real place called heaven. That, that was Jesus' ambition. There, there's, a, there's a passage in the scripture that says Jesus set his face like flint towards Jerusalem. He was ambitious to go there and die on a cross. There was nothing that was gonna stop him because he loves you, he loves you, he loves, he, he loves me. There, there's, a, there, there's a passage in, in, in the Gospel of Luke in the 19th chapter, Jesus is, is having a, a, a conversation with a guy named Zacchaeus, and you might remember the story, uh, Zacchaeus was a wee little man, a wee little man was he, remember the little song you learned in Sunday school maybe, right? So Zacchaeus w- was a tax collector, and, and, and the tax collectors were typically Jewish people who worked for the Roman government. And, and so, uh, as, as we read the Gospels, we'll hear sometimes the, the religious leaders and the, and the people of Jerusalem uh, lumping tax collectors and sinners together because they hated tax collectors. Not, not the way that you and I hate take, uh, paying taxes. They hated tax collectors because in their mind they were traitors. They, they, had, they had sold out their own people. They were working for the enemy. And not only were they working for the enemy, but in many cases, a tax collector would, tax, would collect the taxes that he was required to collect to, to pay to Rome, and then he would uh, collect a little bit more to line his own pockets. And tax collectors, because of this, not only were hated, but in many cases became incredibly wealthy. And so in Luke 19, we hear about this tax collector by the name of Zacchaeus. And Zacchaeus, uh, his life isn't becoming the kind of life he wanted. Even though he's probably incredibly wealthy, there's still something missing in Zacchaeus' life. There's something that's not there. There's a, there's a lostness. There's a, there's a hole. There's an emptiness. There's a, a sense of not being fulfilled, even though by every major human standard, he'd probably achieved everything he had ever longed to achieve. You ever felt that way? And so one day as Jesus is is coming by, Zacchaeus climbs up in a tree. And as Jesus gets close, uh, in, in Luke 19, we hear this uh, conversation between Zacchaeus and Jesus, and Jesus and Zacchaeus. And, and, and Zacchaeus uh, is, is invited down uh, from the tree by Jesus, and Jesus says, oh, and by the way, Zacchaeus, I'm coming over to your house for dinner today. <laughs> and in Luke 19, uh, eight and nine, we read these words. But, but Zacchaeus stood up and said, Lord, look, Lord, here now I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if, if, wink, wink, if I've cheated anybody, I'm gonna pay them back four times the amount. And Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to this house because this man too is a son of Abraham. For the son of man came to seek and to save what? Those who are lost. What was, what was Jesus ambitious about? Jesus was ambitious about people who were far from God. Guys guys like Zacchaeus, who who, who realize they're lost and think there's no hope for them or or are so content with their life, they don't even realize how lost they are. Jesus is ambitious for them and he's willing to, to do the hard work necessary for very lost people to realize that they are invited back home into the Father's house. There's a, another story of a, of a conversation that Jesus has with another tax collector. This guy's name is Matthew. 
Matthew uh, isn't just a tax collector. You and I know Matthew becomes one of Jesus' disciples, one of the 12. And, and, and Jesus in, invites uh, Matthew to, to be one of his followers, and then Jesus uh, does something uh, that he, he seemingly does a lot. He invites himself to, to Matthew's house. Sounds like pastor. Maybe there's something about pastors inviting people. <laughs> Some of you know that if my wife's out of town, as soon as church is over, I'm, I'm like, hey, what are you doing now? Hey, what are you, what are you, what are you doing for lunch? Can I come over to your place? What, what about you? Jesus uh, invites Matthew to be his follower, and then Jesus says to Matthew, hey, Matthew, let's have a party at your house. And, and so guess who Matthew invites to his party? The only people who come, other tax collectors. And we read these words in Matthew uh, chapter 5, verses 31 and following. Jesus answered them, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but it's the sick. For I'm not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Guess why Jesus said those words? Because the religious leaders, the church people, were complaining that Jesus was eating with tax collectors and sinners. What is, what is Jesus ambitious about? Jesus is ambitious about making sure that people of this world, that the world says, or at least the church says, you're unlovable, you're unwelcome, you're unsavable. That Jesus is ambitious to make sure that those people know that there's room in the kingdom for them. He longs for them to find their way home. He doesn't, he doesn't care about the criticism he's going to receive from the, from the religious leaders and the experts in the law. Jesus is ambitious to let the most broken amongst us know we are welcome home. There's no one so lost that he can't find. There, there's, there's no one who, whose sin is so deep that he will not rescue. But there's no one whose sins are, are so enormous that the blood shed on the cross cannot wipe it away. In fact, people, I want, I, want to, I want to pause right here in, in the service for a minute because I want, I want you all to know that these three verses about Jesus' ambition that we just read, those are all examples of God's love for you. I, I, don't, want, I don't want any of you uh, to go home today. I don't want any of you to shut off your TV in a little bit thinking, well, that's neat that Jesus loves some people. No, I want you to, to, to know this. Jesus loves me. Jesus loves you. Jesus loves you. I don't care who you are. I don't, I don't care the sins you're guilty of. I don't, I don't care the thoughts you have. I don't even care what you believe right now. Here's, here's what I want you to know right now. You're loved by God. Jesus is ambitious for you. And if you'd been the only person ever to have been born on planet Earth, Jesus' plan of salvation would have been just the same. He would have come to save you. And since you were the only person here, you would have been the one who would have had to drive the nails into his hands and feet. But he would have asked you to do it because he wants you to be saved. And the only way for you or I or any of us to be saved is for him to die that we might have life. I want to I wanna go back to where I started. Remember, remember these formations? Remember, remember how beautiful they are, uh, this one in Arizona and uh, the one in the Sahara Desert and, and this one in uh, Northern Ireland and the other one uh, back here in the United States. What are you being formed into? How, how, are, the, how, how are your childhood hurts still forming you today? And, and, and if somehow they, they've, they, they've only formed you into a person you don't want to be, how do, how do, you, how do you look at them in a different way? I, I, I've mentioned to all of you uh, about some of my childhood hurts or childhood hurts that I'm not going to talk to any of you about. But I've shared with you some of my childhood hurts. And, and, and I would never wish them on anybody. But, but miraculously, God used them to help me become the person I am. Right? I, I, would, I would not encourage anyone to get kicked out of two colleges in 12 months. That's not the way to earn a degree. But, but somehow God used that to form me, to shape me, to mold me into the person I am today. And, and, and so, again, the question is, how, how is God using the good, the bad, and the ugly forces in your life to form you into the person that you want to be? Your attitudes and your relationships and your, your childhood hurts and your, and your daily habits. 
Here's what I want you to know, that, that in and of ourselves, those things are probably most often going to form us for, into something that we don't want to be. And it's only, it's only the power of God's Holy Spirit that, that can use those forces to make us into something beautiful. And, and not, only, not only does the Holy Spirit use those external things, but the Holy Spirit uses things like Sunday morning worship. Right here, right now, God, God's Holy Spirit is shaping you and forming you and transforming you into the person that he wants you to be. And I think, I hope the person that you want to be. And, and, and here's my prayer, that this, that this transformation doesn't just happen for the hour that you're here, that God's word and the Holy Spirit actually goes with you throughout the week. And as you continue to think about God's word, the Holy Spirit is continuing to transform you. The Holy Spirit uses the sacraments, so the Holy Spirit uses your personal study of God's Word. The Holy Spirit uses prayer to, to transform you. He uses your friends and your neighbors uh, as you gather together to study God's Word. God's Word is used by the Holy Spirit to transform us into not only the people that we want to be, but folks, even more importantly, the people God wants us to be, the people that God has called us to be. The very sons and daughters of God who have been entrusted with the, with the greatest message in the world. There's hope for sinners. And I've, 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 I've joked for several years uh, that my obituary is going to be the shortest obituary ever in the Norfolk Daily News. It's, it's going to be like two sentences long. If Pastor Lee's dead. He was a no good bum but Jesus loved him anyway. That's my only claim to fame. And between this day and the day my obituary is read and written, I pray that God continues to allow me to point people to Christ. Between this day and the day that your obituary is read, may God use us and may God use us uh, all of us here at Our Savior, may God use Our Savior Lutheran Church to transform Northeast Nebraska for the gospel of Jesus. Amen? Amen. Amen. Now may the peace of God which transcends all human understanding guard your hearts and minds in true faith unto life everlasting. Amen. Would you join me for a word of prayer, Heavenly Father? We thank and praise you today for your goodness and for your grace. We, Lord, we thank you that the thing that you are, are, are most ambitious about is us. And uh, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure that out as we read through the Bible. You, your love for us is found on every page. Your desire uh, to, to work hard for our salvation is found uh, throughout the Bible. And, and, Lord, we thank you and praise you that you've served us in such a beautiful way. And we pray, Lord, that you would, you would use all these forces in our life, that you would use our own willingness to serve, to continue to form and transform us, not, not just into the people that we want to be, but the people that you want us to be, that bring glory and honor to your name and to your kingdom. In your mighty and holy name we pray, and God's people said, amen.